respect for water. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Andrew, fire away. Great, thank you, Paul. And I'll get you to queue a few things up in a few moments. Um, so hello, Sally, CJ, Lauren, Diana, Stanley, Matt, Miguel, Matteo, Ingrid, Amy, Paul. Good to see all of you on this Easter, Easter day. Um, so this is class four of Dos de los Cantares, or I'm calling it, you know, like the second of the uh, rounds of the cantos. And last week, we looked at uh, particularly the fifth decad or decad of cantos, which are cantos 42 through 51 which had been published in 1937. And I want to do a couple things with those, just to wrap up those cantos and then move um, rapidly forward. Um, and I'll probably be going back and forth just a little bit. But if you remember last week, we ended with Canto 49, which the cantos are untitled, but this is one that has always been called the Seven Lakes. And it had, it was built out of translations of classical Chinese poems. And if you remember, we talked a good deal about near the end of it, Pound gave the Japanese transliteration of one poem. And we all agreed that it sounded a little bit like what you chant in the Zendos, um, like the Heart Sutra. And uh, if you remember that the canto, we don't have to cue it up, but if you want to go to page 245 and look at the final lines, in fact, there it is right there, Remember, we sort of finished with the K men ran K kiyu man man K jitsu ketsu ko kwa tan fuku tan kai. And then we came to this, what is clearly a very compressed translation of a classical Chinese poem sun up, work, sundown to rest. Dig well and drink of the water. Dig field, eat of the grain imperial power is and to us what is it and then the final two lines the fourth the dimension of stillness and the power over wild beasts so that line and the power over wild beasts immediately echoes the final line of canto 47 which we also read last week two cantos before a canto that really is pulling together um, uh, some of Pound's own personal memories, but it's really sort of a riff off of what he understood to be the Eleusinian mysteries or the old, um, I guess you could say, Mediterranean religion based on the light, on maybe three things, light, intellect, and sexuality, the light of the intellect and sexuality. And in Pound's own you know, in his cantos and in maybe his own mind, he is trying to recreate something of the Eleusinian mysteries, which are very little is known about the Eleusinian mysteries. There's a kind of um, account in Plato, which, as I understand it, is about other than archaeological evidence for certain temples, maybe Plato may be the closest um account by any living person to what actually went on in these sort of underground initiatory mysteries. There have been lots of speculation, including by uh, G. Gordon, uh, what's his, Gordon Wasson, who, you know, thought that it was mushrooms. Um, other people have thought that it, because of the wheat symbolism that maybe there was an ergot that had grown on the wheat and it was like LSD that was going on pound you know this was post pounds time but he had this um you know interest in the Eleusinian mysteries and then the Chinese translations here and the fact that he's got two cantos 47 and 49 that end with effectively the same line canto 47 ends with the line, 
that hath the power over wild beasts. Yeah, if you want to scroll back to that, we remember we had the two Diona, Kai, Morai, Kai, Morai, Adonan, that hath the gift of healing and hath the power over wild beasts. So that echo is very deliberate. Pound is, in a sense, making a larger ideogram going, extending over the course of cantos, uniting the old Chinese, I guess you could say, approach to the natural world, approach to poetry, um, his interest in Confucianism with um, what was clearly a kind of uh, vegetation mysteries. Uh, since we're here at Easter, we may as well invoke it. The death of the year, the rebirth of the new year. We just heard about Aoster from Amy, and of course, uh, so the the little joke that Paul posted about the resurrection. But this is old, old vegetation mysteries, and Pound is finding them both in the Eleusinian mysteries. What he's gotten out of things like Sir James George Fraser's *The Golden Bough*, which was carefully read by T.S. Eliot, by James Joyce, by all the writers of that era, even by William Carlos Williams, who was also making books like Spring and All, which was a sort of celebration of the rebirth of the year. Um, so Pound is building this ideogram, and now I think we're ready to sort of look at how the ideogram also works with Chinese poetry and China. Um, if you remember, those of you who are in the first go round of this, all the way back in Canto Two, we had an episode out of Ovid where Lieus or Dionysus had created a great, made a great transformation of a ship which began to develop jungle like qualities as the boat was stuck in the water and cats began to manifest out of the air, panthers, leopards, and he uses the words cats too. And these cats are the image of Dionysus and lots of classical Greek art. If you look at images of Dionysus, if he's not in sort of a form of Bacchus eating grapes, he will be often being in uh, depicted in a chariot being drawn by panthers or mountain lions or wild cats. Uh, so the cat is the vehicle of Dionysus, or at least the uh, accompanying power of Dionysus. And our ideogram is now bringing classical Chinese poetry in. Um, so we ended on page 245. I want to take a quick look, Paul, at um, the one, the canto just before, before 47. We'll go to page 242. I just want to show something going on here on page 242. Good. This will be, bear with me a moment. This will come back a little bit, but if... Is, is Andrew frozen or am I frozen? <laughs> you know, I asked Andrew to teach this course because I'd heard good things about his course at Europa from Danica Dinsmore back in the day. And I thought, you know, I've not read the canto, so I really like to have a guide. And so he was good enough to, to do it for us. And hopefully his Zoom will be working now and he'll be back in the room. He just asked to re-enter. I just entered, allowed him to enter and um, go from there. So let me just take- Where are they now, Paul? Did I they're, hear sugar? They're up in uh, Boulder, yeah. they're. At Andrew's place in Boulder, and, they, said, uh, they said Sugarloaf. Yeah, so Wherever I think that that's is. I think that's near Boulder. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It is just outside. Yeah. So, um, hey Paul, this yeah. this is a lot to try to read this by yourself. Yeah. You know, it, it, you need a guide. I mean, you obviously need a guide for this. With the, I mean, there was one canto I read twenty years ago. That was hypertext. And so 
If you didn't know the reference, you can click, new tab opens up, it's like, oh, that's what that is. And it, it's just so hard to read something and every third or fourth line have to look it up. So kind of glossing over it. And then Andrew, as he's reading it quite often, um, will say what it means. So he's a very, very good guy. And of course, he's taught at Roper for a long time. And to be honest with you, he, he likes working with you guys. He says, it's so nice to work with adults who are interested in the material. So um, am I back in? Back. You are back in and we are on page 242 and we are, we missed you. Yeah, um, hopefully I'll be able to stay with everybody. We've got this, uh, you know, sort of issue of um, my uh, internet, maybe my server. It may not be, I don't think it's my internet. I think it might be my server. So we'll just have to see. All right. Well, here we are. Fire away. Good. So here we are, you know, about 10 lines down of Canto 48. And I just want to read a few of these to show something. So you see the um, single opening quote, while she bought two pairs of shoes. Everybody see that okay there? Good. While well, she bought two pairs of shoes, two veils, two parasols, an or orchid artificial, for which I was presented with a new kind of net gloves made like fishnet. So the day was not wholly wasted. The priest here had Nuova Mesa, dodicesimo anno EF, Bella Festa, because there was a priest here to say his first mass, and all the mountains were full of fires, and we ran around through the village in Giro per il paese, two men and two horses, and then the music, and on the sides, children carrying torches, and the carroze with the priests, and the one that had to say the new mass, and the carroze were full of fine flowers, and there were a lot of people. I liked it. All the houses were full of lights and tree branches in the windows, covered with handmade flowers, and the next day they, day they had mass and a procession. Please may I go back there and have a new pair of <laughs> Sunday shoes. End quote, Mark. Different tone of voice for the pound, huh? That's actually um, uh, a letter he's just cut into the cantos from his daughter, Mary Rudge, who is up in the Italian Tyrol. And uh, this canto would have been written in either 1936 or 1947. And, um, you know, it's an interesting... I think the reason I wanted to point it out is just a little bit of the sense of where some of our other poetries have come from. Um, you know, you have William Carlos Williams. Yeah, we might we might have better time having Andrew. Um... Yeah, maybe cut the visual and just go for the oral transmission. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Oh, there's take up less less bandwidth. Amy, if I get on my phone, it might cut off my my connection to the computer. So, as the earbuds tend to switch off. So. Well, let's see. Shall we keep trying with me back? Can you all see me? I'm back here. Yeah, and I've I've sent the number. I hope I sent it to ah. you. Um, so the next time, if you go get frozen, you can call in, and it'll okay. be your voice, and that might be the way to do it. So, um, I I texted it to Amy. And I have it. I, you've got the number, so that'll be the dial-in number, and uh, that would be the best way. Should be that be frozen again. Okay, and then that would work on her phone, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we, just, we would just have the audio of you, but then you can direct me and I'll keep the, the screen humming with letters from a, from a daughter or in whatever else. Okay. Yeah, I don't have much more to say about this particular letter. Just, you know, I wanted to show in terms of how Pound is beginning to write and pull on texts from all over the place. And this is one of the very personal moments, of course, where it's this letter from his daughter. You weren't um, going into you weren't going into William Carlos Williams and Spring It All. And I've got a sense that you were about to go into modernist compositional practices. You were beginning to do that. I was very interested. Oh, yeah, sentence. yeah. So I was saying that within a decade, actually, a little less than a decade, Williams, William Carlos Williams would begin 
his poem Patterson, which includes a great many letters, famously from Allen Ginsberg. And then, of course, um, uh, Charles Olson building his poem, Maximus poems, as letters initially, you know, calling them letters from Maximus. And I think it's really um, maybe this particular canto where this comes into modernism, um, you know, the inclusion of text, but not just literary text, not even just scientific text or philosophical text, but uh, actual direct quotation from letters. I mean, if you think back, this would not have happened the previous century. It would not have happened the century before that. This is a really new compositional technique. And as far as I can tell, it's the first moment in the cantos where Pound actually includes a letter. And the fact that it's a letter from his daughter is interesting in that we have now moved historically into about 1936, um, a time when Italy has become quite isolated, or let's say Italy has closed its borders. Pound himself is quite isolated. Um, and there is a growing, what to say, uh, apprehension around the world that not only is fascism on an enormous rise and Germany rearming and nobody knows what to do about it and Mussolini beginning to move. Uh, there's a sense that war is imminent. And Pound is caught in Italy and largely unable to be in touch with his daughter because um, along with the imminence of war comes uh, the, the, you know, the sort of requisition of fuels, of goods, of materials. And I think Pound is becoming more and more isolated. And the fact that he puts in this letter from his daughter isn't just saying, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm copying out a letter because I think it's charming. I think it's a indication of Pound's state of mind. Isolated in Italy, isolated as fascism is developing, isolated as he sees Italy um, arming and preparing for war, and Pound being isolated to what he's getting is Italian propaganda. And as far as he knows, it's mostly the so-called allies. It's England, France, and other countries that are beginning to arm themselves and prepare for a march on Italy. Remember, this is a great time of false fake news or disinformation. And so the state of mind Pound is in and is going to be going into is going to be really, you know, increasingly extreme. So that letter, again, as I said, it's not just some guy putting in a charming letter from his daughter but Pound is really isolated, very worried about his daughter and very worried about the um, direction that not just Italy, but the whole world is going at, the, at that time. This is, uh, also, uh, this is also an evolution of uh, you know, composition technique. So you say this wouldn't have been done, certainly you were alluding to the Romantic era and this Romantic era, this poet is, uh, you know, sensitive teller of truth. And now we're getting into multiple voices. We're getting into found material. Um, and uh, so this had, I mean, this is a sea change in how composition was happening uh, in, in English language poetry. Very much. And when we, we've looked so much at Pound's use of translated material, and building cantos out of multiple poems, Sappho, Arnaud, Danielle, um, Chinese poetry and that sort of thing. And he's also begun to cut in a lot of remembered conversations, a lot of economic texts. He's talked about, uh, you know, his meeting with politicians, his meeting with economists, his meetings with publishers, his meetings with all with Henry James, with all sorts of people. And now suddenly we have his own daughter. Uh, you know, so I think 
and and a letter from her. It's not remembered conversations. It's not descriptions of her. It's her voice is now one of the voices that has entered the cantos. So exactly, Paul, this is, I think, a huge change in compositional matters and how deliberate Pound was about it, whether he was even aware that uh, let's say 1936, here we are 88 years later, and I'm suggesting the inclusion of this letter from his daughter testifies to the great fear and uncertainty in his own mind um, because of, as I said, the arming of Europe for war, the clear evidence of Mussolini's Italy beginning to make moves on North Africa, um, Pound being at a great remove from his daughter. Um, I'll come back to that in a few minutes, but if you remember the story of him at some point feeling he needed to see her and talk to her and walking from Rome to Gassi in the Tyrol, 400 miles basically on foot with no money. And money might not have done much good because there weren't goods around. Yeah, so I think when I froze up, I was talking about uh, just like a little incident during the war when Pound walked from Rome to visit his daughter up in the Italian Tyrol with a one pocket full of maps friends had given him and the other pocket full of biscuits or something to eat. And, uh, you know, that shows some of the extremity going on and some of the reason why he may have included that letter to his daughter. Um, Paul, let's go to page 250, Cant opening of Canto 51, and take a look at this final canto of the fifth decad. Uh, again, published in 1937. This poem, this this final canto of this book was published in 19 was written in 1936. So, Canto 51 shines in the mind of heaven, God, who made it more than the sun in our eye. Fifth element, mud, said Napoleon. With usury has no man a good house made of stone, no paradise on his church wall. With usury, the stone cutter is kept from his stone. The weaver is kept from his loom by usura. Wool does not come into market. The peasant does not eat his own grain. The girl's needle goes blunt in her hand. The looms are hushed one after another, 10,000 after 10,000. Duccio was not by usura, nor was La Calunia painted, neither Ambrosio Predis nor on Jellico had their skill by usura, nor St. Trophim its cloisters, nor St. Hilaire its, prop its proportion. Usury rusts the man and his chisel. It destroys the craftsman, destroying craft. Azure is caught with cancer. Emerald comes to no memling. Usury kills the child in the womb and breaks short the young man's courting. Usury brings age into youth. It lies between the bride and the bridegroom. Usury is against nature's increase. Whores for elusis. Under usury, no stone is cut smooth. Peasant has no gain from his sheep herd. Blue done number two in most rivers. For dark days when it is cold, a starling's wing will give you the color or duck widget. If you take feather from under the wing, let the body be of blue fox fur or a water rat's or gray squirrel's. Take this with a portion of mohair and a cock's hackle for legs. 12th of March to 2nd of April, hen pheasant's feather does for a fly. Green tail, the wings flat on the body. Dark fur from a hare's ear for a body. A green shaded partridge feather. Grizzled yellow cock's hackle. Green wax, coral from a peacock's tail. Bright lower body, about the size of a pin. The head should be can be finished from 7 a.m. till 11, at which time the brown marsh fly comes on. As long as the brown continues, no fish will take granum. That hath the light of the doer, as it were, a form cleaving to it. Deo similis quodem modo, hic intellectus adeptus. Grass, nowhere out of place. Thus speaking in Konigsberg, 
switching the Vulcan result, weird uh, modus vivendi, circling and eddying air in a hurry, the twelve close-eyed in the oily wind. These were the regents and the sour song from the folds of his belly, sang Geryon. I am the help of the aged. I pay men to talk peace, mistress of many tongues, merchant of Chalcedony. I am Geryon, twin with Usura. You who have lived in a stage set, a thousand were dead in his folds, in the eel fisher's basket. Time was the Lee of Cambrai. Um, well, I'm, I'm not heartbreaking, Paul. I, I don't, I'm not sure all that was going on there, but I, I found myself quite moved to tears by, by what he's writing there and, and the state of the world. Well, I think one thing is very interesting. Here he comes. Andrew's coming back, but I'll, I'll just say, you know, I think one thing is very interesting how he was hooked on this usury thing, and look at your credit card statement if you if you have a credit card. I mean, you look at that. And I think that qualifies. Every time I look at my credit card statement, whether it comes, most of them come electronically now, and you see, or I, or I, I guess I check via the website. I, I log in and see it. You get an email that says check your credit rating and and your, you know, your balance and what have you. And every time I look at it, I think of what Ezra Pound was talking about in the 30s. These rates would have been considered usurious. I'm almost certain of that. Back whenever we're talking yeah. 86 years ago. So, um, you know, there's a gigantic prophetic uh, aspect of this, which of course, Andrew, Andrew relates to, and I think we've talked about. Andrew, are you back? Can you hear us? I am, yeah, we had a kind of problem there because- um, uh, Unmute my phone, there we go. Yeah, my, my phone was muted, so I couldn't get back in. And I'll try to stay here again. And if it drops out again, I'll go to Amy's phone, okay? Fantastic. And which is up and running, but it needs to be unmuted for me to, because I, I heard you read beautifully the poem there. Oh, good. And somebody, and I couldn't see who say they were very moved by it. Lauren and, Medley said that. Lauren, yeah, okay. Well, if you remember from last week, this poem now has... Re, you know, has brought back the kind of incantation about usury, um, almost line for line of uh, Canto 45. And then it moves really interestingly at the top of page 251 into a compression or cut up from, yeah, right there, peasant has no gain from his sheep herd. And then we've got a cut up from a fly fishing manual. This is about tying flies for fishing. And most of the commentators will tell you that Pound sees as the alternative to usury, or in other words, if, if usury is um, contra naturum, that working with the will of nature, the vegetation and the restoration of fecundity through the year, um, that in a way, this is an ideogram contrasting usury with these lines from a fly tying and fly fishing manual um, that shows nature's increase as opposed to contra naturum, the um, opposition to nature. Uh, so that, you know, first half of that page is straight out of a fly fishing manual. Again, just to show his compositional methods and what's going on there. Um, we just moved from a letter of his daughter into a cut up of, of, of a fly fishing manual. And then we move back into a little meditation on Geryon, that fourth line from the bottom. Uh, Geryon, who is the image of usury in Dante, I am the help of the aged, I pay men to talk peace, mistress of many tongues, merchant of Chalcedony, I am Geryon, twin with usura. You who have lived in a stage set, a thousand were dead in his folds in the eel fisher's basket, 
time was of the League of Cambrai. Cheng Ming. I wish I, I you know, I, I'm not sure I can pronounce this quite right. I think that first ideogram is Cheng, and it would be a, uh, it would be uh, the the Chinese tone that rises and falls. So Zhang Ming, and this comes straight out of Confucius. This is right name and the um, the Confucian phrase is call things by their right name, and uh, as we all know, probably. Chinese language is very compressed. The line from Confucius might actually just read, call things right name. Um, but this is now being contrasted with what we just got with Garyon. I am the help of the aged. I pay men to talk peace, mistress of many tongues. I am Garyon, twin with usura. And the contrast with that is call things by their right name. Um, this is really important for Pound, and it is um, part of his feeling or far, part of his sensibility that has to do with, we went all the way back to the hell cantos. It's not just usurers, it's obstructors of knowledge, it's obstructors of understanding, it's the publishers who don't want to put a good book in print because they've got so much money invested in their old books, even though the old books are outdated. You know, so Pound is really here onto a sense of we need to restore right speech, right names, uh, call things by their right names. And that's where the fifth decade ends. Um, Paul, you want to go to the next page? Scroll to the next page. Um, these cantos, 52 to 71, we're going to probably not really go anywhere with, but I do want to show you something going on. The opening page of this next book, you can see my screen. This is a copy of the original edition in the United States, the New Directions Cantos 52 to 71. Um, let's see, Paul, can you bring me back to full screen for anybody who wants to pin me? I want to show something here that would be sort of interesting. Um, this book published in 1940, <clears throat> I think. Yeah, 1940 by New Directions. I'll show you this if those of you who like um, books, this is kind of cute. Um, at the back of it, <laughs> there's a little envelope with an insert that has a photo of Ezra Pound and two little essays. One essay by the publisher of New Directions, James Laughlin, and another essay by the poet Delmore Schwartz, who was a New Directions author um, explaining what Ezra Pound is doing. James Laughlin really is explaining in terms of Ezra Pound's scholarship and the sort of content of the cantos and Delmore Schwartz writing about Pound's methodology and metrical patterns and various things. But it's interesting that New Directions felt they could not really issue this book without some sort of explanation to even people who are presumably readers, um, because this book is really doing exactly with a seven volume set of French what Pound has just done with half a page of a fly fisher manual. He takes, um, you know, he does, he devotes 10 cantos to Chinese history and another 10 cantos to the letters of John Adams. And, um, you know, not a, not a thick book, but I think 
even the publisher of New Directions was getting nervous that a book like this might very well be unsellable. And this is what, you know, Ezra Pound was working on on his way up to the outbreak of World War II. Um, this would have been delivered to the publisher in 1939, basically, when, you know, we sort of recognize the watershed moment when World War II broke out. Um, Paul, you want to pull um, up those pages we were just looking at again? So now we'll um, notice this opening page of that canto with the ideogram. He says, no one is going to be content with a transliteration of Chinese names. Um, when not making a desperate effort at mnemonics or differentiating in vain hope of distinguishing one race from another, I mainly use the French form. He's going to start using Latin letters with the French form of transliteration of Chinese. He says, our European knowledge of China has come via Latin and French, and, any, and at any rate, the French vowels as printed have some sort of uniform connotation. This is an, sort of an extraordinary thing to put at the beginning of a book of poetry. Now scroll to the next page, Paul. Table of contents. He has Ray's ideogram from Phenolosa is what we were just looking at. And then he gives us his kind of table of contents of these next cantos, great emperors. We move into the fourth dynasty, Qin and the burning of books. We move to Chun of Tang. We move to Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, the flight of Qin Wen Ti. Go to the next page, Paul. Um, we've got movement up into the contact with Japan, the contact with the Manchu dynasty, the Russia, the Jesuits coming into China. That's Canto LX or um, 60. And then we come down to the John Adams Cantos, which are 62 to 71. You can see that in your book. And now let's look at very important little note here at the end of the table of cantos. Not so much the first paragraph as the second, but note the final lines in Greek, Canto 71. So he ends this book, lines in Greek, Canto 71, are from him of Cleanthes, part of Adam's Piduma. And then this would be a translation of those final lines, glorious deathless of many names, Zeus, I, ruling all things, founder of the inborn qualities of nature, by laws piloting all things. Even this contents page you can now see as an ideogram bringing together three things. China, particularly Confucian China, the letters of John Adams, and what he calls Adams Paiduma. Come back to that word in a moment. The next paragraph I want to look at, other foreign words and ideograms, both in these two decades, or these two groups of 10 cantos, and in earlier cantos, enforce the text, but seldom, if ever, add anything not stated in the English though not always in lines immediately contiguous to these underlinings. Okay, other foreign words and ideograms, both in these two decads and in earlier cantos, enforce the text, but seldom if ever add anything not stated in the English, though not always in lines immediately contiguous to these, I think you could say translations, these underlinings. Um, whether that's Pound's own insecurity or James Laughlin's insecurity about selling copies of the cantos, this is important because it's basically telling you that there's Latin, there's Greek, there's Chinese, there's Old Provençal, there's Italian, there's French, there's Russian words, there's Hindi words, there's Sanskrit words. 
if you don't get them, that's okay. What you don't get isn't going to do anything except enforce what's already there in the tax. Seldom, if ever, add anything that's not there in the English. Let's go back to that upper paragraph. Don't scroll down yet, just right there. Adam's Piduma. Anybody who really wants to dig into this book and dig into, you know, all of this needs to see that word Piduma. That's a Greek word that in some sense means something like culture. It's all the customs, all the intellect, it's all the books, it's all the learning, all the scholarship, all the rights and you know everything from architecture to art to trade practices to marriage practices a piduma is like in a sense the giant ideogram of what a culture is pound starts to use it piduma more as a sense of like that other word i mentioned exernment what do you lift out of culture that is absolutely necessary? And his interest in the John Adams letter is what has John Adams lifted out of his studies of history and culture as he tries to build America? What's the Pi Duma to build the United States of America? And so it only shows up here in the cantos at first as this little note, part of Adam's Piduma is the hymn of Cleanthes. And then just that one line that Pound translates there, but it does give us the clue why Adams is there. Adams was trying to create a culture, uh, a And maybe now back to the phone audio on the phone that is connected. Andrew, if you're hearing me, you're frozen on the video and not muted, but if you can get us on that 510 line that's connected, that would be awesome. I imagine that note, one of the things that was running through my head was, uh, was that note written after? Obviously it was written after because he had the whole thing done. So. The pressure of uh, James Laughlin uh, required that to try and make it a little less incomprehensible, I guess, as part of why we're going over this. So, Andrew, if you're um, if you're available to go through audio through the telephone, that would be very helpful at this time because you are not in the room at this time, and uh, having the audio would be awesome. I feel bad for the poor schmuck who has to edit this video and prepare it for future viewing. Oh, wait a minute, that's me. Uh, never mind. <laughs> so um, I love this line in the uh, last part of the table of contents. It says, Voy it's on the second page, um, voyage to France, and then parents not being diddled by Bergenis or plastered by Dr. Franklin. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> I haven't heard that in 20 years. Uh, Andrew, Andrew, you had a, I'm sorry, uh, Matt, you had a comment you put in the chat. You want to say that out loud as Andrew comes back into the room? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, the reference to Adam's Piduma also uh, inspired a, a poetics journal uh, called oh, that's Piduma. Right. That's yeah. right. Which uh, was going up until 2022, I think. I put I put a link in the chat. Andrew, I see your face, but either you're keeping a very still um, posture or you're frozen again. I'm not sure which. Um, yeah, I think you're frozen. Um, not muted, but frozen. So um, I think going by phone, Andrew, would be the best way to deal with this. And, uh, um, yeah. uh, maybe 
Yeah, well, it's frozen again. I don't know if I remove him, then it makes it difficult for him to come back in the room. And it's the best effect when he's there in video. But uh, now he's definitely out of the room because his. You know, his, Paul, Paul, yeah. I just like to say something. 20 years ago, we would never would have had these kind of convenings. And Zoom and COVID combined in teaching us a whole lot of ways to communicate. And it's really cool. And and I just finished 76 postcards for the peace, the peace month. And um, unfortunately, I didn't send you one because I didn't see you on any of the lists. But I may send you a bonus card. Thank you. I'd, I'd like that. Yeah. Yes, it's a it's a very it's a very good point about Zoom, what it, Zoom has enabled. And I also think that of, of people of a certain generation who knew life before the internet um, and can use these things as tools. We are in a very good situation. However, those who have been born since the internet and depend on these things, um, they're in kind of a dependent state regarding that. Can you imagine uh, growing up with GPS and then having to look at a map? It must be terrifying. <laughs> Paul, before I disappear, you've yeah. got to unmute Amy's phone. Okay. Um, keep okay. <laughs> keep the phone. <laughs> Because I can come I, on, I can come back on by phone, but it, uh, we've tried a few times and it's muted. Um, it uh, okay. I can say ask to unmute, so I can click on that, and I keep clicking on that, and it doesn't seem to um, doesn't seem to allow me to click on ask to unmute. So she she probably has to unmute it herself. I think so, and I. Uh, because I, there's nothing I can do. I, I tr all my my only option is ask to unmute, pin, rename, put in waiting room, remove a report. So and I and I try and clicking on ask to unmute, and it does not appear to be um, functioning. So I go back. And, and Paul, that's a that's a great point that you made about trying to read a map. Can you imagine trying to read a map hands free while you're driving down the road? That's right. Andrew, you're frozen again. So. Uh, Paul, unmute the phone. They can, and I, hear, they can hear you now. Paul, can yep. you hear us? Can hear you, yeah, absolutely. Right. And what comes on the uh, the screen is an icon of the phone. So I guess the phone is now unmuted. Yes, the phone is now unmuted. Good, you hear me now? Absolutely. Let's stick with this for the duration. Okay, good. Let's do this, yeah. And I'll just work without a screen. And I will bring up the... Uh, the text so that we have something to look at besides your phone icon. And so we were talking about other foreign words and ideograms and what have you. So we were in that second paragraph and about to launch into 52, I think. Um, yeah, I wanted to just make sure everybody had noticed that, that combination of actual, probably largely, largely true that you can read the cantos without knowing what all the foreign language says because it shows up somewhere, maybe not immediately contiguous, but somewhere nearby you get the translations. But the other is that I think Pound is starting to feel a little bit uneasy that um, his poem is becoming increasingly unreadable to many people. And this is his putting people at ease. Uh, since I can't see anybody there, um, I may keep touching in just to make sure you can still hear me. Is that right? We can hear you just fine, Andrew. Yeah. And uh, also, I, I'll be happy to direct traffic. So I would just encourage people, if they have a question or a comment, to use the raise hand function, which is under uh, reactions, I guess. And you can raise your hand, and I'll recognize you, hopefully, in the order that you raise them. And we can go from there. Good. So, and 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 good and then alert me because I'm not seeing you. I you can hear my voice, but you're not seeing me. I'm not seeing you. So um, you can just say there's a question, Andrew. How's that work? Yeah, that's a good idea. Or I'll read the question, or I'll recognize someone and they can ask it. So are we going into fifty two then? No. What I want to do is <laughs> basically, I want to basically skip these two decades and skip this book because I think this is something that anybody can read on their own if they want to, but I think we are going to be as a group, you know, better off um, 
instead of reading from these two, I want to go back over what happened to Ezra Pound during the war. These cantos, um, cantos 52 to 71 were published in 1940, which is to say they were delivered to his publisher uh, about the time the war broke out or shortly beforehand. And this is a really crucial period for him. Uh, and I know that I talked about his life in the last go round, but it's not a bad idea to speak to it a little bit more. Italy was arming itself for war. Um, the fact that Ezra Pound and his wife Dorothy and his beloved Olga Rudge, who lived in Venice, all of them were cut off from the countries of their origin, meant many things, including no money. Um, Pound had been living off of some money he got for writing, some money that was an inheritance of his wife, Dorothy, some money that his father sent him from the outskirts of Philadelphia. And now the money was largely cut off. So the isolation became more and more acute in Italy. And at some point, Olga could no longer afford her apartment in Venice. And Italian military requisitioned Ezra and Dorothy's uh, apartment in Rapallo because it was close to the seashore and the Italian military wanted it for strategic reasons. So Ezra and Dorothy moved to a cabin uh, up the hill in the little town of Rapallo, a long walk up, um, I'm sorry, a little town of Rimini, a long walk up from Rapallo. Um, and uh, then they moved Olga in with them into a rather small cottage. And so Ezra Pound's war years were spent living in a small cottage with his wife and his girlfriend, neither of whom liked each other, but they felt that they really had no choice. Um, there was no money, uh, very scant resources. Meanwhile, Ezra and Olga were going, uh, well, were in a state of high anxiety about their daughter cut off from them up in the Tyrol. And with no money, uh, this was sort of threading a needle in a way. Ezra Pound was a believer in Mussolini. Ezra Pound had delivered a book of his poetry to Mussolini to get an audience. And when he saw Mussolini, Mussolini said something like, my, that book of yours is really interesting, which is what everybody says to a poet, whether you've read their book or not, it's interesting. It doesn't mean any comprehension. But Ezra Pound in his state thought that it meant Mussolini understood his book and he decided to throw in his alliance with Mussolini and the Mussolini government. However, at the same time, he needed to make money. And he was very excited and interested in radio. And he worked to get a job on Rome radio, which was controlled by the Mussolini government and was eventually given a weekly radio broadcast which would bring in enough money to support him, his wife, Olga Raj, and to send some money up to marry his daughter up in the Tyrol. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Paul, you there? I'm here. Good, okay. So Pound began to broadcast from Rome radio, and he was led to believe that he was broadcasting on a frequency that went to American troops in the trenches. Um, it seems that actually the band that the Italians were using did not go to the American troops, but Pound thought he was broadcasting to the American troops. And he spent those war years not writing cantos, but writing broadcasts that sound like the cantos at their, I guess you could say their most mad. Um, 
Uh, these were dutifully recorded by the OSS, the predecessors of the CIA, and uh, archived for the eventuality of America winning the war and eventually arresting Ezra Pound and putting him on trial for treason. Ezra Pound, before going on radio, had requested that he sign a legal document that said he was broadcasting his own thoughts and opinions and broadcasting uh, not under the aegis of any government, but simply being given a band to broadcast his own thoughts on. Lawyers tend to think later that this would have exonerated Ezra Pound of the charge of treason. He was not um, being off, he was, in other words, he was not reading scripts given him by the Mussolini government. He was simply speaking his own mind on the radio. It did not go to the troops, though he thought it did. Um, and this is what he did to make money for a number of years during the war. Uh, when the war began to wind down, and particularly when Allied troops landed in South Italy and began to work their way north, a number of things happened. First of all, the Mussolini government fell. Mussolini was briefly imprisoned by Italian, they were called partisans. They were in opposition to Mussolini and in some ways pro-allied. Uh, they imprisoned Mussolini and his mistress and German commandos freed them and took them up to the north of Italy and set up a kind of puppet government ruled by the Germans, but with Mussolini as the head of it. And this was a brief and very painful episode in Italian history. Um, eventually the Mussolini government fell, Italian partisans executed Mussolini and his girlfriend, uh, dragged them into a town square and hung them up, strung them up by their ankles. And this was this a photograph of this was widely circulated through America, through Italy, through France, through the whole world, really, but particularly through Italy and England and the um, victorious allies when the war wound down and both Italy and Germany had fallen. Um, there was a big movement among English and American military to round up people they thought were traitors, people who had worked for the governments, people, in other words, British nationals and American nationals who had worked for Italy, Germany, or Japan in some capacity. And they rounded up quite a few and they executed a number of them pretty quickly. And the call went out to arrest Ezra Pound. Pound, meanwhile, in his rather, I think, mad state, thought that he could be of use to the occupying forces in Italy. After all, he had been living for over 20 years in Italy, knew Italian fluently, knew the coinage, knew the government systems, knew the train schedules. So he went down and offered himself to American forces several times to uh, offer his services. And of course, the American military forces looked at this crazy old man. He would have been um, about 65 and they, or just about 65 years old, and they said, go home. And then Ezra Pound heard that there was a warrant out for his arrest. And he went down and tried to give himself up to the American military and they told him to go home. They couldn't believe that a warrant was out for this guy. You still with us, Paul? I am and you are too. Great. So the account is that one day as a pound was in the little cottage, really kind of a little rural town, way up the hill from the main town, long walk up there, both Dorothy and Olga were out doing various things, and Ezra Pound was at work at his desk translating Confucius when there was a knock on the door. 
He opened the door. There were two Italians with submachine guns, and they said, you're coming with us. And he realized he was being arrested. Most accounts call the Italians with the submachine guns partisans, but Olga Rudge and Town's daughter believed they were just common thugs that anybody who was out marauding around the countryside could call themselves partisans now that the American forces were around. And these guys probably had heard that Ezra Pound had a warrant out for his arrest and might be worth some money. Pound may have thought that that was it, but he uh, stood up from his table, put on his coat, put a copy of Confucius in Chinese in one pocket and a copy of a Chinese dictionary in the other pocket, walked out the door with these Italians. As he began to walk down the long salida or road down to wherever they were taking him, he looked back, he saw his landlady, he threw his, her his key and he put his hands or fingers around his neck and gave a little jerk as though he was being hung and disappeared from sight down the road. As he walked down, he stooped and picked up a little eucalyptus nib, a little eucalyptus seed, and put that in his pocket too. The Italians took him down to the American military. They were apparently not paid any money for him. Uh, he was immediately put into a cement room, one wall of which had bullet holes and blood stains on it, and Pound realized this was a room that was being used to execute people in. So he spent the next 48 hours assuming that he would be executed. Dorothy, meanwhile, returned to the cottage, learned from the landlady that Pound had been taken away. She went down to uh, Pound and was reunited with him briefly. Apparently this um, uh, platoon of the US military, their commander telegrammed Washington DC and said, we've got Ezra Pound, what do we do with him? They said, hold him securely, don't let him commit suicide, we'll get back to you. And a couple of days later they said, uh, he is to go to the detention training center at Pisa. Pound was loaded into a Jeep. Dorothy was not allowed to accompany him. And the military guards drove him to Pisa to a detention center, the DTC or detention training center at Pisa, which was effectively a outdoors prison camp for uh, US military criminals. It was largely soldiers who had either gone AWOL or had committed some sort of crime and they were herded up and put into a big compound at Pisa. Um, within that encampment, there was a death row. Death row was a line of cages, very small cages. I think somebody the other, a, a week or two ago, held up a photograph of the cages. Um, the DTC, Detention Training Center, did not know anything about Ezra Pound, but they got word from Washington that there was an important prisoner coming. They were to guard him with the high security, and under no circumstances were they to allow him either to escape or to commit suicide. So before Pound arrived, they reinforced a cage at the end of the line of cages with um, extra heavy steel. They welded it tight and drew up Klieg lights put on the cage 24 hours. When Pound arrived, he was put into the cage, which not very large, it was about eight feet high and may have measured something like four or five feet wide and was about eight feet deep, but a real cage. And uh, after a few days, 
town began to go probably even more crazy because he had acute insomnia. Remember, he's 65 years old. He's sleeping on the bare ground. He's got Klieg lights lighting him up 24 hours a day. He thinks he may be executed any minute. And there are American military guards with weapons patrolling around his cage day and night. Uh, they eventually supplied him with a little pup tent, which he erected in the cage. But he um, had a complete breakdown, two kinds of breakdown, mental breakdown, and I guess you could say an eyesight breakdown. His eyes became heavily inflamed from the combination of the sun over Pisa and the Klieg lights at night that wouldn't let him sleep. He was brought to the medic's tent and the medic sort of nursed him back to health and became very fond of him and let him use their typewriter. And uh, he was, everybody eventually realized that he was probably not a risk to escape. They had made sure that there was nothing really much around him he could use to commit suicide and the medics let him come to their tent often during the day and use their typewriter. He wrote poetry for the next about seven months while he was in the detention training center, still under the threat of execution because he watched other people on death row taken out and hung. He was within sight of the gallows that will come up in the piece on Cantos. So he had no freedom from the sense that the order might come any day to take him out and hang him. But he was in better comfort. He had the pup tent to sleep in. He had the use of the typewriter in the medic's tent. Um, he seems to have been uh, uh, well liked by other prisoners and some of the guards and the original command that nobody was to talk to him seems to have relaxed. A number of the black inmates dug a trench around him so that Tuscan Rains wouldn't flood his tent at night. We'll see uh, a voice come in that says, don't you tell no one I made you that table. Somebody clearly made a table for him for his tent. Um, and otherwise, he got along pretty well. Eventually, Dorothy discovered where he was and began to hitch rides up to visit him. And um, his daughter, Mary, was able to uh, come visit him once or twice in the time he was there. The family members were allowed in. Olga could not accompany, could not visit him because she is not considered family. Um, Dorothy, had a hard time of it because if you remember the previous time I told you the story, Dorothy's legal father was not named Ezra Pound. He was named Olga Rudge's brother's name because they monkeyed with the papers at her birth um, for various reasons. But eventually Mary got in to see Ezra as did Dorothy who would hitchhike up the coast and usually get rides with military vehicles. But other than that, Pound had no contact with anybody, had very little information. There was occasionally a Time magazine left in the outhouse. And there seems to have been an old anthology of British poetry in the outhouse that was being used for toilet paper by the inmates. And that was his life for a good number of months, about a half a year. Um, one day, a military jeep showed up, a uh, higher ranking officer climbed out, pointed at Ezra Pound and said, get your gear, you're coming with us. You've got 10 minutes. You guys still with me, Paul? Yes, sir. Good. So Ezra Pound had 10 minutes. He threw all of his gear, such as it was, his volume of Confucius, his anthology of, or his dictionary of Chinese, classical Chinese, uh, whatever clothes he had, 
his manuscript of poetry that he'd been writing there and typing up and anything else he may have had and climbed onto the Jeep and was driven to an airfield um, to understand again a little bit some of the state of mind of everybody involved. The US military was very concerned about this, what they thought of as a high profile prisoner that they really wanted to prosecute. Um, they were also concerned that in the sort of aftermath of the war as it was winding down around Europe, there were very few places that would be happy about the top secret military aircraft landing. And they did not want to get caught up in red tape in countries like France and Spain that were rebuilding. Um, they were able to land at on the Canary Islands to refuel and get on to Washington, D.C. with Ezra Pound. One of the um, eyewitness reports by these military cops who accompanied him, or really they were federal marshals, was that Ezra Pound looked pretty crazy on board the airplane. He was walking back and forth up and down the aisle of the airplane, muttering to himself. Um, his partner, Olga Rudge, puts that in perspective. He had never been on an airplane before. You know, this was not only really extraordinary circumstances for anybody, but he too, he had never been on an airplane before. So of course he was walking up and down the aisles, looking out the windows, quite astounded by it all. He was brought back to the US, Washington DC, and um, due to the federal marshals, they decided to put him through fairly rigorous psychological profiling and the psychologists came out and said, the guy is pretty crazy. He cannot understand the charges against him, the charges of high treason. And we recommend that he not be put on trial. Um, it would be a fiasco because he's not fit to stand trial. And Ezra Pound was basically remanded to St. Elizabeth's Hospital for the Criminally un Insane, put under the tutelage of the warden, you could say, or the head of the hospital there, um, and went into a political limbo um, for the next, I think it was 17 years. He lived in that bug house, as he called it, at St. Elizabeth's, having never been found, having been found insane and therefore unable to understand the charges leveled against him, he could not be put on trial, which means that no matter how hard his friends worked with lawyers to get him exonerated, he could not be put on trial. He could also not be pardoned by an American president in any easy way because having not been found guilty of a crime, there was no crime to pardon him for. So this is the political limbo he went into. And his friends worked for decades to get him sprung from the prison. Uh, Dorothy Pound came and got a little apartment in Washington, DC. Uh, and he was fairly liberally allowed visitors, all sorts of people went to visit, as I've mentioned, from Diane DePrima to Allen Ginsberg to Paul Blackburn to W.S. Merwin um, to Charles Olson, Robert Lowell, many, many people went to visit him. Elizabeth Bishop, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, that book of his that he wrote, Peace of Peace on Cantos, received the most prestigious poetry prize, a brand new one in America, the Bollingen Prize, very controversial because it not only gave a prisoner in the bug house the award for poetry, but it also gave somebody that the US government considered to be a treason poetry prize. And this was big news in all the news magazines, all the newspapers, and it was written about 
endlessly with all sorts of op-ed people weighing in on both sides. Many people thinking that he should be hung. Many people thinking that he was a victim of circumstances or that he was crazy or that he was the nation's greatest poet and that it was a travesty that he was in the hospital. Any of you who want to read any of this can go and, you know, check it out endlessly in the biographies. A uh, great little book that came out called a Facebook on Ezra Pound. It had documents, including legal documents and articles in Time Magazine and Life Magazine, the New York Times and the Washington Post, on and on and on. Um, but I think as a group, we will probably be better off going right into the piece on cancer because those are something that we do not want to miss. Um, and I think if you would like to read the 10 cantos of Chinese history and the 10 cantos of John Adams' letters, as somebody noticed, not being diddled, diddled by Ver Jin or plastered by Dr. Franklin, um, you can certainly read it and maybe we will drop back into it at points, but the um, whole of the piece on Cantos are hugely important. And I think through the minds of many people, the core of the Cantos, and also very importantly, the place that probably most Americans who read Ezra Pound came into the Cantos. Who could ignore the piece on Cantos? They had received the Bollingen Prize. Ezra Pound was, if not front page news every day, he was regularly in the newspapers. People were readily, readily editorializing about, about him. If you read Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Newsweek, if you read the New York Times or the Washington Post, you saw his name there all the time um, being written about. There were people on the streets yelling to have him hung. There were thoughtful artists and academics making the case that he should be freed, that this was a travesty of justice. Um, he was, uh, he had friends in high places, not just his publisher, James Laughlin, Laughlin at New Directions, but there were various people like Robert Frost, who was well known to a succession of administrations as the American poet. There was Archibald MacLeish, who I don't think anybody reads as a poet anymore, but knew a great many of the players in Washington, D.C. And uh, so a quite controversial person for a long, long time. And particularly around the piece on Cantos, which is where readers of poetry mostly came in. And I think these are the Cantos that our immediate elders from Prima, McClure, Pound, Ginsburg, to Levertoff, Baraka, Freely, Olson, W.S. Merwin, the list goes on and on and on. And, uh, you know, these are, I don't have to say it myself, but in many people's view, the heart of the cantos one of the great books of American poetry ever written and ever published. And uh, I think this is what we're going to go into and go through rather carefully. Notice that 1940 was when the Chinese and the John Adams pamphlets were published. They were all written before America entered the war, before America declared war, because they were turned over to his publisher, well, really in 1940, so largely 1936 to 1940, during the period of the ascendance of fascism, the outbreak of war, that book um, was quite obscure with the Chinese cantos and the John Adams letters and anybody who wasn't already an Ezra Pound aficionado would have thought it was a really unprofitable book to try to read as poetry. There was, there were two cantos written before the piece on cantos. These were probably written around 1944, written by Pound in Italian, 
at the time that Mussolini had, his government had fallen and he had been restored in a kind of puppet government by the German commandos. And these were published, well, Mussolini was set up in a town called Salo, S-A-L-O with an accent, Salo. And these are called the Salo Cantos. And they are often seen as adulation for Mussolini and his order, but they were suppressed and only added to the final edition as we have it of the cantos. They were not, I think, put into the cantos until something like 1986, written in Italian. Subsequently, one of them was found in a translation by Ezra Pound, and that was added in two. You can find a translation by somebody else of the other one of these solo cantos. Um, Talk about fake news. Um, Pound learned in around 1944 that the Tempio Malatesta, his favorite piece of architecture in Italy, the great Tempio built by Sigismundo Malatesta that Pound saw as the model of his cantos, he heard that it had been destroyed by Allied bombs. Um, fake news. It had been damaged, it had not been destroyed, but just to give a little indication of the fake news that had gone around, there was, and the solo cantos are worth reading at some point, but they are both based on fake news that was going in the general panic in 1944 when the Mussolini government had fallen. Nazi Germans were coming down from the North, Americans, and British and French sappers were coming up from the South. It was a war-torn country and people were widely panicked and fleeing in all directions. And the news that was going around was quite wild. Um, so those cantos were written before the piece on cantos but published much, much later. It's really the piece on cantos that become in some sense the cantos for um, or let's say portal into the cantos for modern times. Andrew, talk to us about the connection uh, be between Pasolini and these cantos and the, and the general. Obviously, it's a it's a commentary on fascism and libertines and what have you. Um, but it seems to me um, relevant to what we're what we're speaking of here with a with a um, solo cantos. First of all, Pound made what I call his fatal error by deciding that Mussolini was a great figure like Sigismundo Malatesta, like Jefferson and Adams, and like Confucius. And complex ways for each of them, Pound had published a prose book called Jefferson and or Mussolini, which was a kind of manifesto thrown at the American people. Um, Pound thought of Mussolini as a tough guy, but heroic with a good heart, who was really trying to deal with the absolute intolerable economic and political conditions of pre-war Italy. So Pound had begun to think of him as a reasonable figure that was probably propped up by a lot of Italian propaganda. And don't forget that Pound eventually supported himself by broadcasting on the radio and the radio was government radio in Mussolini's government. So maybe a little bit of, um, uh, what's that term psychologists use where you sort of justify things because anyhow. Um, but when Pound wrote the solo cantos, he was, he had fallen for a lot of the fake news. He had come to believe that American and Canadian forces were destroying the great um, monuments of Italy. They were raping Italian women. They were looting, they were burning. From the reports Pound was getting on the street, the barbarians were coming up from the south the other barbarians, the German Nazis were coming down from the north. 
and the only hope was the Mussolini government in Salo. And those two Salo cantos are very spooky. They are based on no plays that Pound had translated back in 1915. Um, so 30 years earlier, they're full of ghosts, real ghosts. You can say ghosts are real, but they're more ghostly than the other cantos. And a last desperate look at a really collapsing Italy and collapsing Italian dream. And to Pound, there was a there was a dream which he was seeing now utterly destroyed. Maybe most importantly, his dream of writing a book of peace. And in the wake of World War II, it was only now becoming clear to him that World War II had been worse than World War One, which is where he had begun his book. Does that answer a little bit, Paul? A little bit, yeah. Any any other specific questions about Pound Mussolini? Don't uh, I don't see um, I don't see any hands up. I don't hear anyone popping in. Then maybe the thing to do is um, with the bit of time that we have left. By my clock, we've got about ten minutes left. Why don't we start to go into the piece on Cantos? My book, page 425, but probably your book, Paul, 445, because your book has the solo cantos. And if anybody really wants to go through some of those, we may go back to them. But I want to go into the piece on right now. Tell me again, so page see if 450. 445. All right. I, I believe I have. Canto, Canto 74. Got it. Or L. Good L X X I V. And I'll just um, say one one last thing about uh, Pasolini. The film Solo is not for the weak of heart. <laughs> there are, there are, I remember watching it with Meredith, and she said, "Why are you making me watch this?" <laughs> I said, uh -huh. "I'm not making you watch it. Uh, you're free to turn it off." But she watched it, uh, and it is uh, yeah, it, it's something you're not going to soon forget and um i can't i can't recommend it but, but it's related to the content of at least what pasolini thought about fascism and then of course he was he was run over by mafia or fascists at the end so paid for paid, paid yeah. the price for, for making it yeah okay canto 74 the opening of the piece on cantos and remember pound is in his cage at pisa where he will spend about six months, maybe a little less than six months. The enormous tragedy of the dream and the peasants bent shoulders. Manes, Manes was tanned and stuffed. Thus Ben and La Clara a Milano by the heels at Milano. I'm not going to gloss everything, but I want to just gloss this. Manes is the name of the founder of the Manichaeans. And he was apparently hands and stuffed. That's the echo there of the old Inez who was disinterred in Portugal and put back on the throne to be worshipped by the men who had killed her. Um, I think a little echo there, but we've got that. Then we've got Ben or Benito Mussolini and his mistress La Clara, who had been executed and dragged to Milano and hung up by the heels in the town square at Milan to be celebrated by the partisans, the allies, photographed and circulated around the world. So nobody gets off clean here. So we're going to have to deal with a little bit of the uncleanness here. Um, but that, I think, quite stunning opening two lines, the enormous tragedy of the dream and the peasants bent shoulders, which Pound is probably looking out through the bars of his cage and seeing hardworking men out on the road, as always, taking the brunt of war. The enormous tragedy of the dream and the peasants bent shoulders, 
Manis Manis was tanned and stuffed. Thus, Ben and La Clara a Milano, by the heels at Milano, that maggots should eat the dead Bullock. Digonus, Digonus. Digonus means twice born, and it's a name for, well, maybe we'll come back to it, uh, Dionysus. Digonus the twice born, Digonus but the twice crucified, where in history will you find it? Yet say this to the possum, bang, not a whimper, with a bang, not with a whimper. Just to remind everybody, coming from T.S. Eliot's poem, The Hollow Men, this is how the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Yet say this to the possum, a bang, not a whimper, with a bang, not with a whimper. To build the city of Dioche, whose terraces are the color of stars. The suave eyes, quiet, not scornful. Rain also is of the process. What you depart from is not the way. And olive tree blown white in the wind, washed in the Qiang and Han. What whiteness will you add to this whiteness? What and or um, I mentioned earlier the little ideogram of the Eleusinian mysteries and Confucius and the old Chinese poetry. You might pick that up a little bit from what you depart from is not the way. Sounds very Taoist, but it's actually Confucian too. The way being the Tao. You cannot depart from the Tao. Everything's part of the Tao. And then notice the literal ideogram and olive tree. That's the Mediterranean. That's the Eleusinian mysteries. And olive tree blown white in the wind, washed in the Qian and Han. What whiteness will you add to this whiteness? What candor? Count has lifted this out of his Confucius Dictionary. He discovers the word that people use to translate candid or candor in the Confucius um, accounts of Confucius actually comes etymologically from an ideogram that means white or whiteness. And this is a line that is supposed to have been spoken by Confucius at his death. What Candor, can you add to this candor? And Pound glosses it. Notice it's the olive tree that's blown white by the wind and washed in the Qiang and Han. What whiteness? Will you add to this whiteness? What candor? The great paraplum brings in the stars to our shore. You who have passed the pillars and outward from Heracles when Lucifer fell in North Carolina, if the suave air give way to Shiroko, oi day, oi day, Odysseus, the name of my family. You may remember that oi day, which is the name, the, the phrase Odysseus gave to the Cyclops when asked, what's the name of your family? Oite, said Odysseus, no man, no man, no man, no man, Odysseus, the name of my family, the wind also is of the process. Arela la luna, sister moon, fear God and the stupidity of the populace. But a precise definition transmitted thus Sigismundo. Thus Duccio, thus Zwan Bellen, or Trastevere with La Sposa, Ponce Christi in Mosaic till our time, deification of emperors. But a snotty barbarian, ignorant of Tang history, need not deceive one. Uh, there's different glasses on who that snotty barbarian is. Um, 
the immediate reference is to Mongols coming down to the courts of Tang and know nothing of Tang history. They're ignorant of Tang history. They're being taught by the Chinese emperor, but the rhyme with that, the snotty barbarian is either Hitler, who has shown up as a snotty barbarian in an earlier canto, or it might be F.D. Roosevelt. But a snotty barbarian, ignorant of Tang history, need not deceive one, nor Charlie Sung's money on loan from Ananimo. That is, we suppose Charlie had some. And in India, the rate down to 18%, but the local loan lice provided from imported bankers, so the total interest sweated out of the Indian farmers rose in Churchillian grandeur as when, and plus when, he returned to the putrid gold standard as was about 1925. Oh, my England, that free speech without free radio speech is as zero, and but one point needed for Stalin. You need not, i.e. need not take over the means of production, money to signify work done inside a system and measured and wanted. I have not done unnecessary manual labor, says the Roman Catholic chaplain's field book, preparation for confession. Squawky as larks over the death cells, militarism progressing westward. Invest in Nick Noyes, nothing new in the West, and the Constitution in jeopardy. And that state of things not very new either. Everybody good so far? Yeah. And now we're going to have a little insight into what's going on with Ezra. A little quote from Dante. A sapphire for this stone giveth sleep. Remember I told you he was suffering from acute insomnia because of the pain in his eyes and the cleek lights on him all night long. Of sapphire, would this stone give us sleep? Not words whereto to be faithful, nor deeds that they be resolute. Only the bird-hearted equity make timber and lay hold of the earth. And Ruth found they spoke of Elias, and telling the tales of Odysseus. Oite, oite, I am no man. My name is no man. But Juan Gina is, shall we say, Juan Gin. We've got three little rhymes happening here. We've got from oite to no man, and no man rhyming with the Australian deity I'm sorry, the South African deity, Wanjina, which is now being rhymed with Wanjin, a figure out of Chinese mythology. Um, but we'll come back to that in a moment. I am no man. My name is no man. But Wanjina is, shall we say, Wanjin, or the man with an education, and whose mouth was removed by his father because he made too many things whereby cluttered the Bushman's baggage. V-Day, the expedition of Frobenius's pupils about 1938 to Australia. Wan Jin spoke and thereby created the named, thereby making clutter the bane of men moving. And so his mouth was removed, as you will find it removed in his pictures. The pictures are um, old rock art from Australia of Wan Jin or Wan Jina, whose mouth had been removed because he was cluttering up the nomadic Bushmen by giving them too many things. And then notice the move from as you will find it removed in his pictures, in principio verbum, in the beginning, 
the word paraclete or the verbum perfectum in seritas from the death cells in sight of Mount Taishan at Pisa. Pound could see a little, well, in the, in the, on the horizon, he could see a mountain outside of the death cell at Pisa, and he named it Mount Taishan after the great central mountain of China. So this shows you where he is and the rhyming he's doing or the ideograms. In Feritas, from the death cells in sight of Mount Taishan, at Pisa, and bet that's the first time an at ever showed up in a poem in America. Drop that down for another first fall. Got it. As Fujiyama, as Fujiyama at Gardon. He's remembering when he had walked through southern France and at Gardon, he saw a mountain and thought of it as Fujiyama. As Fujiyama, Gardon, when the cat walked the top bar of the railing, and the water was still on the west side, flowing toward the Via Catullo, where was sound ever moving in diminutive Olu Fluis Boyos. That's a great Homeric word, meaning loud roarings were given by Homer to the ocean, the Mediterranean, the Polu Fluis Boyos, loud roarings. Or the sound ever moving and diminutive polu flores boyos in the stillness outlasting all wars. Hold for a moment and pause there. This is almost prophetic. Remember that seven lakes cantos, the one built out of the Chinese poems that end with, ended with two lines. The first line was, Stillness, or rather, I'm sorry, the fourth, the dimension of stillness and the power over wild beasts. And we know the beasts for pound of the power that comes with cats. And now we've got him remembering the cat walking the top bar of the railing near the Via Catullo. And as we just, the passage we just end, ended, in the stillness outlasting all wars. Quick little echo there, the cats in the stillness and the memory of an actual cat, but it's still got the power in the stillness outlasting all wars. La donna, said Nicolette. La donna, la donna. Cosa deve continuare? Why must I go on? Say Bosco, if I fall, said Bianco Capello, non casco in Genochion, I will not fall on my knees. Why must I go on? Say Casco, if I fall, non casco in Genochion, I will not fall on my knees. And with one day's reading, a man may have a key in his hands. Lute of Gassir. Ooh, Fossa. Then came a lion-colored pup bringing fleas and a bird with white markings, a stepper under les six autons at six gallows, pounds looking out and seeing the gallows, a bird with white markings, a stepper under the six gallows. And then that makes him think of Vion, Absoudre, que tu nous absolve. May you be absolved as well. Lay there, Barabbas, and two thieves lay beside him. Infantile synthesis in Barabbas, minus him in when, minus on tile, a bullet, and by name, Thomas Wilson. Mr. K said nothing foolish, the whole month, nothing foolish. If we weren't dumb, we wouldn't be here. And the lane gang. Notice how he's stitching in a line there just that he's hearing out among the people in the detention camp or even on death row. If we weren't dumb, we wouldn't be here. And the lane gang. Butterflies, mint, and lesbian sparrows, the voiceless with bum drum and banners, and the ideogram of the guard groups. 
That's one of those lines I think is remarkable. I'm just looking out and seeing the four guard rooms, the machine gun nests on the towers at the edges of the detention center. And he's seeing them as Chinese ideograms, the ideogram of the guard rooms. El triste pensier si volja and should thought turn towards Adusel, towards Usel, a ventador to the ventador, the troubadour, the town to ventador, va il tensire, il tempo rifolge, ventador goes the thought, the time turns back. This is Pound now composing, not quoting, because he doesn't have any books with him. This is him composing. Notice the mix of Italian and French and maybe even some old Provençal. Bad thought turned towards Uso, towards Ventador goes the thought. Time turns back. And at Limoges, the young salesman, out with such French politeness. No, that is impossible. I have forgotten which city. But the caverns are less enchanting to the unskilled explorer than the Urox is shown on the postal. The Urox of the European bison seen in the caves out there. So the caverns are less enchanting to the unskilled explorer than the Urox is shown on the postals. We will see those old roads again. Question. Possibly, but nothing appears much less likely. Notice this movement of his mind as he's going in. And that to me would be like the core of his mind right here. Will I ever see those old roads again? And he doesn't even put a question mark. He just says question and answers it. Possibly, but nothing appears much less likely. He's looking out at the birds striding under the six potons, the six gallons but nothing appears much less likely. Comma, not even like the end of the line. Madame Pujol. And there was a smell of mint under the tent flaps, especially after the rain. And a white ox on the road toward Pisa, as if facing the tower. Dark sheep in the drill field, and on wet days were clouds in the mountains, as if under the guard roofs. A lizard upheld me. The wild birds would not eat the white bread from Mount Taishan, the sunset, from Carrara stone to the tower. This day, the air was made open for Guanon of all delights. Guanon, of course, being the Japanese for Guan Yin which is the Chinese for Avalokiteshwar, but Kwanon, the goddess of mercy. This day, the air was made open for Kwanon of all delights. Linus, Cletus, Clement, whose prayers, the great scarab is bowed at the altar. The green light gleams in his shell, plowed in the secret field, and unwound the silk worms early in tensile. And the light, the light is the virtu. Want lumina, everything, said Erigenus Scotus, is light. As of Shun on Mount Taishan. And in the hall of the forebears, as from the beginning of wonders, the paraclete that was present in Yao, the precision at Shun, compassionate in you. Guider of waters. I think this is where we'll end today. Paul, are you there? I am here, and I'm grateful. Are there we any last such... comments or questions? Yes, let's let's open it to um, to folks. If anyone has uh, wants to pipe in, if anyone's left, <laughs> I think we have most of the folks left. An empty okay, chair. Then two. you can wrap it up. Very good. I'll do it. Um, Matt, 
uh, Trace will be your host next week and uh, he'll be getting the Zoom room link particular for next week out to the list. Matt, I think if you, oh, you, I BCC'd folks, so you don't have. Oh addresses. yeah, I just sent it, then I sent it to you, Paul. So if you want to send that out and then send me the list so I can send the link out next week. Okay, I'll do that. Um, thank you all for your patience. The trouble with the uh, connection. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we'll so, pick up with the um, piece on. We'll pick up with the piece on where we've left off or maybe touch back into a few of those earlier passages, but we'll pick up there on page 449. And the meat of the book, right, Andrew? The meat of the book. The meat of the book, yes. Very good. All right. Thank you all. Happy okay. Easter. We'll see you Thank in April. Thank you. Happy Easter. Stay well. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Paul and Andrew, for getting through that. Yeah. And thank you all. You handled the technical stuff very well. Thanks, Miguel. Without losing it. That was good. I lost I lost many cuticles during that. <laughs> They're replaceable. <laughs> good to see you guys. Bye.